All right, good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Merry Christmas. Love this time of year. You know, we all have different traditions. Some of you, you know, you're all about the live Christmas tree. Who are the live Christmas tree people? Like it's just not Christmas without a fire hazard in your living room, you know? So that's the only way it's legit. Others of us are good with the fake Christmas tree, right? Just a little funky smell, some cobwebs, but, uh, but we're good, no problem. Then there's like Christmas lights. Some people are all about like uniform, white colored lights, real clean on the outside. Other people are all about colored lights, green, blue, purple, the more the merrier. In fact, like flashing and all of that, right? Go, go crazy with it. And then there's like Christmas Day traditions. Like some people open presents on Christmas Eve and any Christmas Eve people, a few of you, it's like six. I grew up a Christmas Eve family, you know. Other people open presents on Christmas Day. That's the day. So we all have our Christmas traditions. Um, I know like in our family, uh, we would uh, open one present on Christmas Eve. Uh, my wife would allow us to do this and it would be what? Pajamas. It feels like child neglect, frankly. We would open one present, the kids would get pajamas, then they would sort of sleep in our bedroom on the floor. They'd bring in the couch cushions and all of that so we could kind of keep them in there. And then we would go down early. One of us would go down, make sure everything was ready for Christmas, and then they'd come running out of their room. And uh, that was always a Christmas tradition. And then Christmas morning after gifts, I would always make breakfast. It's the only time all year that I cook, but I still do this. I make breakfast Christmas morning, and I make... Um, pancakes for each member of the family, and I make the pancake in the shape of the letter of their first name. So that's what my dad used to do. So it's a tradition that I've kind of carried on and, and passed on. And then because Christmas in our family always comes after a million Christmas services, we're just exhausted. And so you guys do big Christmas dinners, some of you, you know, you do all the turkey and the dressing and all the things, right, for Christmas dinner. We, I've already ordered our, ours for this year. We just get Lou Malinati's Chicago-style pizza, and we just start popping them in the oven. And there's not even like a lunchtime or a dinner time at our house on Christmas. It's just game over. You sleep, you wake up, you eat, you go back to sleep, you wake up, you eat. It's perfect. We all have traditions. We also have some disappointments, right? Like I remember when I was a kid one year, I really wanted the Star Wars Millennium Falcon. And I had like begged my parents, I had dropped all the hints, I had, you know, left little things around the house. And still when Christmas came, I can remember that feeling I did not get the Millennium Falcon. That's why I related to this uh, social media post. Check it out. This person says this. This Christmas, I celebrate the 37-year anniversary of not getting the G.I. Joe aircraft carrier. The 37-year anniversary. Anybody feel that? People were chiming in like, I remember when I didn't get the Barbie Dream House or the Easy Bake Oven. We have our disappointments, and, and sometimes Christmas can be idealized. We think it's got to be a certain way for it to be meaningful and good in our lives. But the truth is, life is often filled with disappointments, and I don't doubt that some of you are facing Christmas right now, going through some of your own challenges and disappointments, maybe with work, maybe with family, maybe with friends, maybe, uh, maybe you have to work on Christmas, maybe, maybe certain people aren't coming to town or you're not able to get to them this Christmas, maybe you've lost people in your life. Life that you love dearly, and as Christmas comes around, that you just miss them more intensely. And I think that's what I love about the original Christmas story. When you really go back and look at it, the original Christmas story was so far from perfect. We've kind of made it into like a Hallmark moment now, like a Hallmark card. Here's the Holy Family, and it's Kumbaya, and everything's amazing. But I think the truth is, like when you go back and look at the biblical story, you realize there was a lot of tension and fear and stress going on. In fact, let's look at the gospel account of Jesus' birth from Matthew. We often read from Luke, and Luke's amazing, but the gospel of Luke tells the story of Jesus' birth from Mary's perspective. The gospel of Matthew, Matthew tells it more from Joseph's perspective, the husband. And in Matthew, you realize, here's this guy, he's engaged to be married to this girl, and then all of a sudden she rocks up and tells him, hey, honey, I'm pregnant. And they've never been together. But it's okay, I haven't been with anybody else. This is God's baby. 
And Joseph reacts like we do. You know, Joseph's like, no, I'm not buying that. I wasn't born yesterday. I didn't just kind of rock up out of nowhere. I know how these things happen. And he's like, I, I, I don't buy it. And so this is what we read in Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 19. It says, Joseph, to whom she, Mary, was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to help me out on this word. Say it with me. Break the engagement quietly. Did you know the original Christmas story starts with Joseph basically trying to figure out how to get out of this crazy engagement he's in? He's like, how am I going to break this off without embarrassing her too much publicly? That's some drama. That's drama. In fact, in the ancient world, an engagement was seen a lot closer to a marriage commitment than we often see engagement in our kind of world. I mean, you know, engagement isn't anywhere near like marriage commitment. In fact, my wife and I, in a couple of weeks, we will celebrate 26 years of marriage. Awesome. My wife needs like awards and medals and all the things. But I just found out a couple years ago, I mean only a couple years ago, that with the day we got married, I was standing at the altar and Lori's at the back of the church, right? And her dad's standing beside her. Her dad is about to walk her down the aisle. Everybody we know and love is in the room. All the people that are important to us. People bought plane tickets, people traveled, people paid money. They're there, they're sitting. We got tuxes on, we're all dressed, we're waiting. And I'm at the front of the church waiting on my bride who I love with all my heart. And as she's standing there with her father, her father turns to her and says, honey, if you're having second thoughts, we can turn around and back out right now. <laughs> I didn't, I only found this out a couple years ago. He says, we'll, I'll, we'll get in the car right now and we'll drive off. Everything will be fine. I'm like, I can't believe that. <laughs> Just leave me at the altar. I mean, I love her dad, but I found out then, man, that's where I was on the pecking order, you know. We'll drop him. He's dead to us. We're leaving. <laughs> Say the word. See, we take engagement a little less seriously. Thank, thank God she was like, no, I'm in. I'm all in. We take engagement a little less seriously than they did in this time in the Jewish world. And so when Joseph's considering breaking the engagement, it's a huge thing. And he knows there are big time ramifications. And he's a good man. So he's trying to figure out how to do it without embarrassing her any more than she's already about to be embarrassed, right? He's ready to end this thing. And so in the midst of the drama of the first Christmas, we're reminded that God is with us even when it feels like everything is against us. And we see this in Joseph's story and we see it in Mary's story because God is gonna show Joseph the way and he's gonna remind him that he's present in his life and he's going to show him that he's with him even in this storm. First thing we see in the original Christmas story is simply this, that God is for you. That God is for you. You know, the most eventful thing that happened in our, in our life this last year is a hurricane, Hurricane Ian. We were in Florida when Hurricane Ian made landfall. And we were there because we, Lori had agreed to speak at a conference, so we went in early to be at this conference. And the whole time we kept thinking they're going to cancel this conference, but Floridians don't think that way. They're like, no, no, we're in, man. We're, no can we don't cancel for anything. So we're in Orlando. So if you remember, Hurricane Ian's coming in on the west coast of Florida, down closer to the tip of, of Florida. And so they're basically like saying, hey, Wednesday morning, it's a shelter in place order. Like if you're not where you need to be by Wednesday morning, like, I don't know, 8 a.m., then, then it's a no-go for you. And now it's Tuesday afternoon. And we're still doing this conference, and my wife's supposed to speak Tuesday night. And I remember I'm standing outside at this hotel where the conference is, and they are sandbagging the doors of the hotel, y'all. I'm watching them, and I'm like, we have got to get out of here. <laughs> this is crazy. And so... Um, they didn't cancel the thing. They said, you know, we're going to do it. So Lori was one of the last speakers on Tuesday night. And as soon as she was done, we're like, we got to get out. I mean, it's shelter in place by Wednesday morning. We got to go. 
So I'm, everybody's like huddled around all eight people that are left at this conference. And they're like, look, man, how, how are we going to get out of here? People are like, we're going north. You got to go north. We're going to go to Nashville. We're going to drive all the way up to all these places and try to fly out, get ahead of the hurricane. And so this is all the discussion. I didn't know what to do. So I called one of my dearest friends who lives in Fort Lauderdale, who's a, a lifelong um, uh, Floridian. And I said, hey, what do you think I should do? He said, look, I know everybody's telling you to go north. But as a lifelong Floridian, let me tell you, if I was you, I would go south into the storm. <laughs> you guys, Floridians, man, you're another breed altogether, you know? I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, man, go south right into the storm. He goes, because look, if you go north, there'll be no gas at the gas stations. There will be no hotel rooms. There's a high likelihood in all the traffic and congestion, you could get stranded out on the highway or the side of the road. He goes, if you go south and you hug up the eastern coast, you're just going to have the outer band, just going to have the outer bands of the hurricane. No problem. And then there'll be gas along the way. You can get hotels. And if you get down to Miami, if they close airports. Miami will be the first airport to open, which by the way, I don't think for Hurricane Ian, they even closed the airport. They're crazy down there. It's like, oh man, that 500 mile an hour wind, it's over there. We're good. We'll just take off this way. What? Lori speaks. She does her talk. We jump in the car and we're like, we got to go, you know? And so we start driving south into the storm. And I got to tell you, by the time it got dark, we were in the outer band of this hurricane. And I mean, it was raining like I have never seen rain before in my life. The wind's blowing a million miles an hour. We're going 20 or 30. Cars are around us with their hazards on and we're hydroplaning along. We're just trying to manage. I can't see a thing. And I don't know about you, but when I can't see anything when I'm driving, the very first move is to turn down the music. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about right there? This is an old people move, right? You know, like, hey, turn on the music, turn on the music, I can't see. <laughs> turn it down. And then I'm like, turn on the interior light, turn that light on, maybe that'll help me, you know, and they, they turn the light on. I, no lie, at one point, the music's down, the windshield wipers are blaring, it's I can't see 10 feet in front of us. And uh, we got the indoor car light and I take my glasses off. I'm like, I can't see anything. Delilah's on the radio. I don't know if anybody remembers Delilah, but my wife's singing 80s love songs and I'm like, we're gonna die. She's singing Whitney Houston. Then we get this on our phone, popped up just out of nowhere, um, both of our phones, emergency alert. National Weather Service, tornado warning in this area till 745. Take shelter now in a basement or an interior room of the lowest floor of a sturdy building. If you're outdoors in a mobile home or in a vehicle, move to the closest substantial shelter and protect yourself from flying debris. Wow. Now I grew up in sort of tornado alley, so I'm accustomed to tornadoes. You know, when there's a tornado alert where I grew up, you just kind of walk out in the front yard, see if you can see it, you know. Anybody, you see anything? It's all about kind of what you grew up around, right? Lori grew up in the same area, but she had a very different reaction. She's like, we gotta get off the road right now. I mean, she literally grabbed my arm and she goes, right now. And I'm like, it's Lori, it'll be fine. She's like, right, and she goes, look, I found this motel at the next exit. Now we're at this point kind of rural area in the middle of nowhere. She's like, here it is. She holds it up on her phone and I t it looks exactly like Bates Motel. I'm like, I am not going to some motel in the middle of nowhere, Florida, where a serial killer is going to take me out. I will take my chances with the tornado. At least I'm familiar with tornadoes. I mean, she's, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Twister, but she's seeing like cows flying across the freeway in her mind. And it was apocalyptic. Anyway, this goes on for hours and hours. Finally, we get down into the Miami area, and I'm like, man, we survived. And our friends call us, and they're like, look, it's too crazy to try to get all the way down towards the airport. Why don't you come to our house in Fort Lauderdale and just shelter in the storm? And so we drove to their house. I remember pulling up in their driveway, and I like teared up, y'all, because I was like, we made it. It's a safe haven in the midst of a storm. That's what a refuge feels like when everything feels like it's out of control. And you know, I think Christmas 
Christmas reminds us that God is for us even in the midst of our own storms, that God can be a refuge and a safe place for us even when everything's going crazy in our lives, even when it feels like we can barely stay on the road or barely figure out how to keep moving forward. God is for us even then. And he shows up in Joseph's life and he affirms to him that Mary is to be his wife. Look at this, Matthew chapter one, beginning in verse 20. I'm gonna read this when we get to the red word, say it real loud here with me. It says, as he considered this, Joseph, he's considering breaking the engagement. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be what? Afraid. Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, the angel actually told Joseph the same thing that he told Mary and that he told the shepherds, do not be afraid. Anytime somebody leads with do not be afraid, right, you know there's reason to be afraid. You know, you see some dude in the alley, hey, don't be afraid, man. I'm like, okay, (laughs) now I'm afraid. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And, and, And he says, Jesus literally will save his people from their sins. You know, that's what Jesus came to do. That's the ultimate Christmas gift. You know, our biggest problem in life, um, you know, isn't that we're unhappy. It isn't that we're unfulfilled. It isn't that we're stressful. It isn't that we don't have enough money. Our biggest problem in life from a biblical spiritual standpoint is that we are under the judgment and wrath of God for our sins and our failures. And that God himself has provided Jesus Christ as a sacrifice for us so that we could be in a right relationship relationship with him. He came to save us from our sins. That's the Christmas gift. That's the Christmas gift. And we all need that saving because the Bible says we've all uh, sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all like sheep gone astray. I don't know if you saw that social media post that was happening um, a few weeks ago. There was in China this uh, sh- this sh- sheep herd that just started walking in a circle. Do you guys see this? And like, like for 12 days, they were catching it on like, you know, farm cam or whatever. Like these sheep are just walking in a circle for 12 days. Circle, circle, circle. People are like, what's happening? What's going on? I, I don't know. They had all these medical kind of diagnoses. I'm like, but I can tell you this about sheep. Everything I've read about sheep, they're not the smartest animals. And more than likely, part of what happened, and, and, and one, of the, one of the Chinese people actually said this, a few of the sheep started to do it first. Like, like one sheep was like, look at me, I'm going to walk in a circle. And then this other sheep's like, oh, that's cool. I'll walk in a circle too. And then pretty soon, the whole herd for 12 days walked in a circle. Sheep are not the smartest animals. And the Bible calls us sheep. (laughs) And it suddenly feels kind of appropriate, doesn't it? (laughs) We all like sheep have gone astray. We've, we lose our way. We get lost. Sin just means to miss God's mark. And the Bible says we've all missed the mark. But, but the good news is John chapter three, verse 16, and for the famous verse that you see like held up at football games. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But verse 17 is my favorite. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Like God's motivation at Christmas was to save. Jesus came to save us from our sins. That is the gift of grace. The gift that declares God loves you even when you're a mess. That he can forgive you even when you feel unforgivable. That he's for you even when you sabotage yourself. That he places a high value on you even when you feel worthless. That he calls you his child even when you fail. That he's near even when you feel far. That he has a future for you even when you can't see it. That he will complete the work he began in you even when it feels impossible. That he created you, he knows you, he loves you, he redeems you, he restores you, and he walks with you. 
It's the greatest Christmas gift. God is for you. It also reminds us Christmas that God is with you. God is with you. We have a new member of our family this last year. We got a, uh, a dog. She just turned one year old. Um, her name is Stella. I'll just put a little picture up here of this is her Christmas outfit. And her shirt says, resting Grinch face. And that's pretty much what she has. In fact, um, it's interesting. Look at those big ears. She doesn't listen for anything, y'all. She just does what she wants. It doesn't matter what it is. In fact, I was starting to think that our dog was deaf. And then I realized every time I go in the kitchen and grab a chip bag and crinkle it, she comes running from all corners of the house, right? So she can hear brilliantly. She just chooses not to. And I look at her. I, we love, we're dog people, so we love her. We're crazy about her, but she definitely does what she wants. We barely potty trained her in a year. Outside of that, she's like, this is my house, don't you know? I mean, our other dog used to come in and roll over on her back, you know, show her stomach. You guys have dogs like that, like real submissive and all that? Never once has Stella shown her stomach. She's like, <laughs> resting Grinch face. Sometimes I think we're like that with God. We don't always listen well. We don't always dial into his word and follow it very well. Sometimes we wonder if he's listening to us. Sometimes we look around at all the things going on in the world, war in Ukraine, all the drama of the headlines, and we wonder, like, where is God in all of this? And Christmas reminds us that God is actually with us even in the drama and the suffering we create. Look at this, Matthew chapter 1. Verse 22, it says, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is what? With us. It's built into Jesus' name. This child who was born in humble circumstances would grow to be a man. A man full of wisdom, a man without sin, a man dedicated to doing God's will. He was baptized in the Jordan River by John, and God spoke, and he said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. For three years, he healed the sick, and he fed the hungry. He helped the poor. He made the lame walk and the blind to, uh, to see, and he gave hope, forgiveness, and love to all who would follow him. At the end of his ministry, he was crucified. The just for the unjust the perfect for the imperfect, the sinless one for the sinner. On the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. After his resurrection, he says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In fact, his last recorded words in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, he says, yes, I am coming soon. His birth paved the way for us to experience a new birth and a right relationship with God. His life, death, and resurrection gave us hope beyond the grave. In fact, Jesus is given many names in the Bible. He's called the Messiah, the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Father of Eternity, the Prince of Peace, the Holy One, the Savior of all, the Good Shepherd, the Faithful Witness, the Bright Morning Star, the Lion of Judah. He's called the Lamb of God, the author and perfecter of our faith, the chief cornerstone, the head over all things, the fountain of living water. He's called the Word, the Rock, the Mediator, the Advocate, the Way, the Door, the Truth, the Life, the Gate, the Servant, the Day Spring. He's called the Vine, the Beginning and the End. He's called the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, and he's called the King of all the rulers of the earth. But most importantly for us at Christmas, he's called Emmanuel. He is God with us and God for us. And that means that even when you feel alone, you're not alone. And even when you feel abandoned, 
Jesus has not abandoned you. And when it feels like no one sees you, Jesus sees you. When it feels like no one is listening, he's listening. When it feels like no one cares, he cares for you. When it feels like no one knows what you're going through, Jesus knows. When it feels like you haven't got a friend in the world, Jesus calls you friend. And when it feels like nobody is looking out for you, he calls you his child. He made you on purpose for a purpose, with a purpose. He's equipped you and empowered you, and he calls you forgiven, free, filled with his spirit, and ready to live in the new life he offers you. That's the gift of Christmas, the gift of Jesus, that we may experience new life. Christmas reminds us that God is with us, even when everything's against us. This holiday, maybe you're in a place in your life where you've never really crossed that line of faith. And I would love to give you that opportunity just to reach out to God and to ask him to move and work in your heart and in your life. In fact, I wanna ask everybody to please bow your heads and close your eyes. If you'd like to become a follower of Jesus today, you can begin that journey by repeating after me a simple prayer, either out loud or in your own heart and mind, just a tool to help you reach out to God. Just say, dear God, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life and help me face the challenges that I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you in Christ's name. And friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's your prayer today, if it's your commitment, I want to ask you to just slip your hand in the air. Just make eye contact with me, just to say before God, to say to me, you're going to follow him. You're going to trust him in your life today. God bless you guys. Just slip your hand in the air. Thank you, guys. Let's reach out to him today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. God bless you. God, we thank you for your love, and I thank you for each person reaching out to you today. I pray you fill them with your goodness, your mercy, and your kindness, and remind them today that they are not alone, that you are indeed with them as you are with us. We commit ourselves to you, and we thank you. In Christ's name, amen. Well, let's put our hands together for those who made spiritual commitments in their life today. If you made that spiritual commitment, we have something we want to give you after service that will help you mark this moment in your life. We're going to tell you more about that in just a moment. But for now, we have a tradition here at Central that we close out our Christmas experiences by singing Silent Night together. And so I want to ask all of you to take your candles that you should have received when you came in. Go ahead and stand where you are, please. Our ushers are going to come down the aisles and they're going to begin to light these candles. And as your candles lit, why don't you just pass that light on to the person next to you. And um, we're going to spread some light around this room. One of the reasons we light candles is because Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And literally, he shared his light with his disciples, first with James, with John, uh, with Peter, who went on out into the other disciples. Then through the disciples, his word began to spread in Jerusalem and then to Judea, the little further out, and to Samaria, a little further out and all the way to the ends of the earth. And here we are, 2,000 years later, celebrating his birth and remembering who he is. Isaiah, the prophet, whose verse we just read quoted in Matthew, who said his name will be Emmanuel, God with us. He's also the prophet that said that the Messiah, the Christ child coming into the world, that he would be a light that would shine into the darkness. And friends, when we take his light and we share his light, we shine into the darkness. In fact, I'm gonna ask you just to lift your light up in the air and just to notice the impact that we can have when we shine our light versus when we don't. Will you lower your light real low for just a moment? And when we hide our light, 
the world becomes a darker place. But when we shine our light, lift your light real high again. We shine the light of Jesus and his love to others. So let's sing together, Silent Night, and celebrate the light coming into the world.